you tell somebody something, they like to hear you say it, but he probably making that up, you know. But when you tell it to somebody that done lived it, it's a whole different ball game. I'm Marie Therese Coin Coin, plantation mistress. Let me tell you a little about my life. I was born a slave in the household of the gallant Saint Denis, commandant of the post at Natchitoches. This story begins, but it never ends. It's about Marie Therese Coin Coin, an enslaved woman of color in the household of Saint Denis, commandant and founder of Natchitoches. It is believed that uh, Marie Therese Quan Quan, you know, she used her, her prestige, she used her money, she used uh, the incredible wealth, I suppose, that she had uh, been able to amass after she was freed um, to definitely help all of her children, you know, get set up with their own plantations, with their own, um, you know, land and, and money to, to, to have a good life. It's very difficult being born in 1742 to be a woman of color and come from slavery and into freedom and wealth and power. This is that story, Resurrection Fern. I began my journey in Los Angeles, California, tracing my roots here in Louisiana, and I came across Marie Therese Coin Coin and Claude Thomas Pierre Metoyer story. I met a lot of different uh, descendants, uh, historians, worked in a genealogy library, and I've been doing research for over 10 years. This story is about not only a woman of color, but also a whole entire dynasty of a family, the Metoyer family which we have descendants of over 10,000 people across the globe, all the way from France to Louisiana, to Chicago, California, Texas, all over the world. And it's important for them to know who they are. And I would like to tell that story today. Marie Therese Coin Coin was born in 1742 in the household of Saint Denis, the commandant and founder of Natchitoches, of Fort Saint John Baptiste. This place is the oldest place in the Louisiana Purchase. And before the Americans came, this was a French settlement. The people came all the way from La Rochelle, France, Quebec, Canada, and they f settled here as early frontier men and women. The unique part about this story is that in her time of being here, she was able to raise up out of slavery, free her children from slavery, and own her own land. So this is an important story for people to know because a lot of the stories that are told today are not about people of color and freedom. So I want to let everybody know that in the 17th century there were free people of color and they were wealthy. They weren't all slaves. And these people, Jeans de Color Libre is called free people of color. This fort's actually based on a fort that St. Denis helped establish in the year 1714 when he passed through Natchitoches. St. Denis was on his way to make a trade route to Mexico. Ends up getting captured and a few years later he makes his way back in Natchitoches and the fort's established. Um, St. Denis was a founding father of Natchitoches. He was a staple here for over almost 40 years. Um, and he's really the reason that we've maintained control between the French and Spanish territory. Um, a lot of people don't know that St. Denis fasheries or cow pastures are located on NSU's campus. Apparently the first floor fort was lower, close to the river, and it flooded. And I've always believed that what some people told me, the second fort was probably up on the hill where the American Cemetery is on 2nd Street because it does sit up yet you can still have a shot down to the river and then to the south on Northwestern's campus is where supposedly St. Denis maybe had a home and definitely it's where he kept his cattle and horses. 
Saint Denis came out here in 1699 with Iberville and Bianaville, who were the early settlers. When he started the fort, he had his own slaves, obviously, and he had her parents, which is Marie, Francoise, and Francois, her father. Now, little is known about them, and we're still trying to trace their roots, so in hopes that people will be more into discovery, I've been able to trace maybe Francois to um, New Orleans to the particular priest, Father Boubois, who had a plantation in New Orleans um, with the Jesuit priests. That area is still there today, but the Jesuit high school is in that area in New Orleans. And they had a sugarcane plantation. But because when the Spaniards came in, they were able, they destroyed the cemeteries and the plantation, and so little um, records are, are left to be um, seen. The mission at Las Adeas had a um, Spanish Catholic priest, and that may be who you're talking about, and he came and did mass for the, the French here in Natchitoches, and because uh, that was their only option and, and, and now it's tying together a little bit that St. Denis requested a Jesuit from, from France or wherever, maybe via New Orleans. I've been able to put pieces together to find out a little bit more about Francois. And in order to tell her story, you kind of have to go back in time in that era of 17, say 34, when her parents were here in Natchitoches, I believe that um, Francois was brought here by a priest, a Jesuit priest named Father Vitry, who came from La Rochelle, France, to New Orleans, and he was requested by the commandant to have his own priest here um, as a Jesuit priest. They had a Spaniard's priest, but he wanted his own particular priest that spoke French. So he brought him here, he requested him to come, and he came here from New Orleans on a Pierrot which is a, a type of a boat at that particular time made out of wood. When, we, when um, Father Vitri came here, he brought two slaves with him, according to record, that one was named Francois and the other was Caesar. You can see Caesar and Francois in the um, church records of the baptismal records and the marriage records. Once they got here, in 1734, they were sold to Saint Denis by the priest Father Vitry. The following month or so, Caesar and Francois were married, and usually the owner of the slaves, after he has them baptized, he would usually marry them off. And so that is what happened to Caesar and Francois. They remained in his household until the death of Saint Denis. Caesar was married to a Marianne, and Francois was married to Marie Francois. We believe today, as a descendant, and other descendants and historians believe today, that Caesar and Francois possibly may be brothers because they never were separated. And Marie Francois and Francois, at their marriage, were, as we are told, the parents of Marie Therese Concon. And at that particular time, Saint Denis had already passed away in 1744, so they had been heirs to um, his wife as property. All of these people are passed away now. Her parents, Saint Denis, um, Meme Saint Denis, the wife, and now this is the first time in her entire life that her and her brothers and sisters will be separated. When Marie Therese Coincoin was sep was given to as heir property to the eldest son of Saint Denis, they moved to Appaloosas. So he was a soldier and he was a trapper and a trader, and so he was a very busy person. So her and her brother, her eldest brother John Baptiste, were now property of his, and the other brothers and sisters went to the other children. Little is known about some of them, and some of them actually stayed in this particular area. While she was living with the eldest son in Opelousas, Marie Therese had five children. Little is known about the father, but according to legend and history, the person's name was Chata. Now, little is known about what that name actually means, but I've been able to see a few different hints. I saw a book 
and the name of it was Chata Uma, and that was meaning Choctaw. So some people in the descendants think that the parent, the father of her five children, is a Native American. Some believe that he's complete African. But in my um, tracing of information, the Chata was the meaning of what Choctaw meant. And if you can look at that and see different um, spellings of that word chata. So that's still a mystery that there's lots of mysteries that come along with this story. And that's one of them. She had five children before she met Matoir with an Indian, Native American Indian, and he left Natchitoches. And they don't seem, I read that he left Natchitoches and nobody knew where he ended up. But anyway, uh, one of the daughters, uh, ended up in Appaloosas, Louisiana. And she went down to purchase that daughter and she only had $5 to put down. She was able to put the $5 down, talk to the owners to let the daughter raise cattle on the land to help pay the note. She was a very determined woman. In 1767, the most significant event occurred in my life. I'll never forget that date. There appeared in Natchitoches a young Frenchman, a white man named Claude Thomas Pierre Matoir. My, he was handsome. He did not find me unattractive either. Although I was 25 and the mother of five children, that same year I was leased by Matoir, who became the father of my 10 Matoir children. Claude Thomas Pierre Matoyer, a young Frenchman, came here from La Rochelle, France, in search of wealth and title, land, you know, in the New World, New France. He came here with Antion Pavi, his friend, and they had their brothers with them, which they stayed in New Orleans, and the two, Antion Pavi and Claude Thomas Pierre Matoyer, moved on to Natchitoches to be a part of the early settlement of this particular place. That is where he met Marie-Therese Concoin in the household of Meme de Soto. Many people believe that it was love at first sight and some believe that it wasn't maybe love at all, that maybe it was an arranged situation, a liaison, a plissage, which was at that particular time the, the black codes denied black and white to marry. That was against, that was illegal, that was against the law. Claude Thomas Pierre Matoir asked Mim de Solo if he could lease Marie Therese Concon as his own slave and she could return in time because her children were still with Mim de Soto. But this relationship liaison turned into 20 years and 10 children and that created the first Matoir dynasty. Claude Thomas Pierre Matoir has been said with Auntie I. Pavi to be one of the top five wealthiest of all of Natchitoches. Owning the most slaves, he was probably the second or the first person that owned the, most, the majority of the slaves at that particular time. So he's very wealthy, became very a wealthy man. But Marie Therese Concon, because of her upbringing here in Natchitoches, she knew how to, to do the lay of the land. They grew tobacco, they grew um, indigo, um, corn. This is before they started doing cotton. She was trapping bears. They used their hides and bear grease and they imported and exported these products to New Orleans all the way to France. And the indigo was used for the war and the, the oil was used to for the the bear grease was used to for the equipment and the dye, the indigo dye was used for the uniforms. So it was very instrumental what they were doing to bring that those products back to France. So she was the only one that really knew how to do the crops, especially tobacco was a very difficult crop to do. So she was able to be very instrumental with Claude Thomas Pierre Matoire and teaching him how to become wealthy by teaching him how to use his land. They had 10 kids together, you know, and so uh, when they split up, 
he gave her her own little uh, plantation down here, her own, her own plot of land. And that's where her and her kids grew up and that's where she made her living and made her money and, and did quite well with her children. They pretty much didn't anything they wanted. And I guess that's why uh, Claude Thomas you know, took a wife and you know the controversy with the uh, Cuban priest up there. Uh, you know, he having all these uh, uh, mixed race kids for this woman then coming up here and expect me to baptize all these people, you know, and well, he had money. So, you know, just like then, that money is influence. You know, you had a lot of influence. One of the most powerful things about the Marie Therese Quan Quan story is imagining, you know, trying to imagine how, how she, you know, how she felt um, during that period where she was with Claude Thomas Matoire and, you know, the, the Spanish priest keeps trying to break them up uh, and how, you know, both of them basically defied this very influential and powerful public figure uh, to stay together. But then for, you know, that relationship to then end uh, years later and, you know, and she was on her own. And for someone who, you know, she grew up enslaved, she was with this man for 20 years, um, and then and then she's she's independent. And how, you know, how did she react to that? How did she feel about that? There must have been a powerful sense of relief because, as I said, she, you know, went to try and attain that freedom for the children that were not yet uh, free. Um, but you know, how did that feel? Did, did was it scary? Uh, was it exciting? You know, um, I, I wonder about that sometimes. And I think there's so many different emotions she could have been feeling. It was such a new situation, um, but she was obviously such, just such a hard worker, and she had clear goals about what she wanted to accomplish. That uh, you know, um, she was able to do it, and that's really inspiring. Her her ex is a little different than a lot of other people's exes. Uh, it, it's almost kind of a semi cross. But when the ones I've seen, she has she's done it like that every time. So she knew, I guess, she wanted to make sure that hers was significant enough to be able to be told different from others. And when you don't, when you don't have the ability to write the language, you have to have X amount of trust. So I am sure she trusted uh, the notary. Uh, that was that was doing these transactions just like we trust our notaries and uh, attorneys and everything else. Some of these maps do have the area where it's it shows the um, the original uh, area of Marie Therese Coin Coin, the town site of Natchitoches, um, the other uh, her descendants where they lived, where they moved. Um, some of the uh, people that that uh, Marie Therese traded with, uh, the Matoires traded with, the Rash, a lot of the any uh, number of families, um, several of the different families of the area, and um, how they are they are these um, uh, little dividing areas are all sections where people property are and uh, it's sometimes you have to use a magnifying glass but right then you would you could take this information and then go back to the courthouse and do a title search and find out more information about where where an individual lived where they moved if they traded their land and things of that nature so yes Marie, Marie and her uh, Therese Coin Coin and her descendants are uh, many of them in that in that kind of a map. As you know, Marie Therese had plenty of um, property transactions. Well, in you can tell they're older when you're in book number three, and it was from 1813 to 1816. Uh, so. So Marie Therese had a couple of conveyances and a lot of the, back in the corner we've got the, what we call the French archives and 90% of it is in French, there's some English and so I just struggle through it and try to come up with the, with the right deal. But as you can see, uh, it says 
Well, and, and Marie Therese, as you know, signed with a special X. And, um, but it just shows it was witnessed and, and she had multiple transactions of property up and down Red River at the time, <laughs> uh, what is now Cane River. Uh, she had multiple transactions up and down. And uh, as you know, she very well could have been the first lady of color, lady of color, a, a female that was a property owner and conducted business uh, in, in the early 1800s. That's very significant um, and, and something that, that we, we find neat and are, are, and are proud of to, to have that, uh, th those documents. She's just one of the many historical people that we have documents from. Um, she used all kind of weeds and different things that grew around the plantation to make medicine out of it. They had stuff like they called the whole how that should have been good for cold. And uh, they had other kind of pepper plants, wild pepper plants they would use to make tea and all that kind of stuff. I imagine they must have gotten it from the miracle. Uh, the Native American because it's all they had here at one time. Grandma would always talk about her. <clears throat> she would talk about how she would treat patients, you know, treat sick people. And that was most of the thing that she would say about her. She was always ready to treat somebody that was sick. I don't know how she uh, got to know about medicine, if she got it through the Indians, or how she got it. But she knew a lot about medicine. And they always said she had a call call. And then later on, she passed her knowledge of medicine or her call call to somebody else. Free people of color community was the fact that Claude, uh, Claude Thomas Pierre Matoir, the Frenchman, and Marie Therese Coin Coin together had these family of children, these 10 children. But what was, I guess, unique about it and great for us as a community was that he acknowledged his biracial children, if you want to look at it that in today's terms, you know. He acknowledged them, and not only did he acknowledge them, he set them up so that we were really, in a sense, never actually slaves. We were slaves. He had, of course, we were owned by our father. Him, I mean, they were owned by their father, but on his death, he freed them. Mm. So in that sense, not only that, he gave them land and a start so that they could acquire the, what they had. Not only that, he brought his Augustine to France with him and toured France, and that was the whole genesis for this church because when he went back to France with his father, he saw how each one of the little small communities over in France where his father uh, had came from, and each community was centered around a church, and he said, I would like to do that when I came, come back to Louisiana. And that's what he did. And that was the first church that's in the painting of, um, that's in his painting that was hanging in his mansion. Well, this church here, and I'm just going to kind of go different ways because, like I said, there's so much. We can just kind of focus maybe a little bit on the church and who built it. Uh, according to tradition and legend, and from what I've heard from my family, it was that Augustine gave the money in the land and his brother Lewis was the architect and the builder of the first church that you see in the painting. The church got too small, okay? There was some controversy on whether we were adding on to it and everything, but got too small for the community, so we built, they tore it down, and they built this one on that existing site. So this church is 
was built, uh, the present day church was built in 1917 on the site of the original church that you see in the painting. There's only a few items that are original, like the bell in the church and a few other items. We've lost, for the most part, everything else um, over time. You know, things get lost. So when they came back from France, that was very big influence on Nicholas Augustine's life in order to um, build the church, which is the St. Augustine Catholic Church, which is still standing to this day. It became the center of the community, and it, it still is the center of the community for the Creole people of uh, Breville. He was grandmother's grandfather, my grandmother's grandfather. That's all the things that my grandmother would tell me about her family, you know, and about, she called him Pepegi Stan. That's what she'd always refer to him as, Pepegi Stan. They were about the only family that had property back in, back in those days. If she lived anywhere else, she was living on somebody else's property. If you saw the portrait in the next room, of uh, Marie Therese had the 10 children. Augustine was the oldest and he was a twin with Suzanne. And there's a photograph of his son and Marie Therese, Augustine's son and the twin sister Suzanne, daughter. Those two were first cousin and they were husband and wife. Uh, they could not uh, marry outside of the Creole race. The whites didn't accept them and the blacks. So for 175 years, you had to stay in that Creole race. Well, part of the, uh, the research center, we have some of the portraits of uh, the Matoires that were donated by Pat Henry um, back in the 70, 1970s. And because of his donation, we have three portraits of three members of the Matoire family. Um, this portrait is of, that, as far as we know, is of Marie Agnes Passo Matoire. And she was uh, Augustin Matoire's uh, wife. The, my understanding is this portrait was done in the 1830s. And she married uh, Augustin Matoire around 1792. Um, she was um, a free woman of color. These are the originals. This is the original frame. She is uh, August, August Augustin Matoire's uh, son. Is, uh, this is her son, August Augustin Matoire, 1800 to about 1830. Um, and somewhere in the 1830s, this portrait uh, was painted. We don't know who painted the portrait. Uh, we believe Marie Agnes' portrait was probably painted by uh, Julian Hudson, but we're not sure of, of really positively sure who actually painted all three portraits. Auguste Matoire marries uh, Marie, Agne, uh, Marie Therese Carmelot Anti Matoire, and this is. Um, Marie Therese Carmela Anti Matoire's portrait, and it's dated uh, again around 1830. Marie um, Marie Therese Anti Matoire uh, is um, is the daughter of Suzanne Matoire, and Suzanne Matoire was Augustin's uh, twin sister. Marie, um, Marie Suzanne Matoire was the daughter of Marie Therese Coin Coin. And um, Marie Therese Coin Coin, um, so this would be Marie Therese Coin Coin's granddaughter. This is Marie Therese Coin Coin's daughter in law. And Marie Therese Coin Coin's grandson. So we have the grandchildren and daughter-in-law of Marie Therese. And that's how we sort of have the lineage of Marie Therese Coin Coin as a part of the Cami Henry Research Center. 
And so when uh, Louis Matoire was given the land grant for the land I'm standing on now, um, he was technically still um, enslaved. Um, he wasn't freed for another uh, few years, and so a lot of people believe that Quan Quan helped him um, get that land grant, and so she was actively involved in uh, making sure that her children, you know, had a much better uh, start in life, in their adult life, than, than she did. <laughs> the only thing I ever heard was Frenchmen and our people. Mm. That's it. The rest of Louisiana, I guess, always have identified with their European heritage, especially what the Creole community, you know. Why, in all of my years growing up with my grandfather and my grandmother, both sides, I never heard the word Creole. And she said, I'll tell you why, because you were not allowed to use that word on King River. And I said, why is that? She said, I'll tell you, because being as secluded as we are on King River, way in the country, in the sticks, and we owned all this land. The whites referred to themselves as Creole. Mm. So you'd, you couldn't use that word. So rather than identify with their African ancestry, they identified always with their European ancestry because they really didn't see themselves as black and they didn't see themselves as white. They looked at themselves, they viewed themselves as kind of like this third race of people if you want to look at it as a race, okay? So, and that was the way it was up until the Civil War, of course, and then you had to identify with the one drop rule and all that. You had to identify with one or the other. So you did have to be black or white. So of course, we couldn't deny we had one drop of black blood, so you fell into the black uh, race category, and it was codified into law, right? So the law says you was black, so you better follow the law or you're breaking the law. So that's why, but as, as a people, not everybody, but that some people down here, because they were less than a generation removed, a lot of the people, even the blacks that worked for them, keep in mind, they were free. They owned a lot of their, their, their grandparents. They were slaves because, I forget how many Augustine, Augustine had 109 slaves. I mean, that's a lot of people. And after the Civil War, they had their freedom, but what are you gonna do? You still gotta eat, you still have to eat. So a lot of the people stayed in this area and they said, okay, that's how the sharecropping and all this kind of stuff came about. A lot of people today know them as the Creole, the Creole culture. But in the beginning, that word was actually used um, with the Portuguese and went on to the Spaniards and went on to the French so that they can identify the different people that were born to the New World. This area was New France, New World. This was not America at that particular time in Louisiana. So these are the people that actually founded Louisiana. A Creole is a, a bloodline of Native American. Uh, my dad is a full blood Native American. He's of the Mississippi Choctaw tribe and came out of uh, Bayou Lacombe. So uh, I'm part Bayou Lacombe Choctaw. My, uh, my real uh, name is Koi Hatchutuckney, uh, which means snapping turtle, Hatchutuckney. Uh, Koi is the first name, which uh, is Black Panther. And then I have my mother's side of the family, which is all Creole. And so with that uh, bloodline, which is a Native, a Native American, French, and Black, so those, that bloodline is, constitutes the Creole bloodline. We lost the language at my grandparents' generation. And um, I can remember uh, Miss Pearlie Boatwan telling me when she first started school, and I can tell you how we lost that, I know how we lost that. We lost the language because when she started school, all she spoke was French. Mm. But remember after, during the Civil, before the Civil War, we had nothing but French nuns, because this was French territory. So the priest here had French nuns. So we, the, the language survived on the river, but after they left because they couldn't hold school during the Civil War. So that's when they brought in the English-speaking nuns. So the Sisters of Divine Providence, I think that's what they were, because I didn't go to school on here, but that was, that was 
the, the order that took over. They said, yes, they would come down and teach. Well, because they could not speak French, they did not allow the students to speak French at school. You had to speak English. And they would get punished if you spoke French at school because they didn't know what they were saying. So, you know, so they could have been saying something about the nuns and making fun of them, so they didn't do it. So she says she can remember getting her hand slapped for speaking French at school. And that's when the language sort of kind of faded away. When I was going to school, that's during the time that they said that the Creole people couldn't talk it on campus, on the school ground. And all of my kinfolks, all my uh, first cousin and second cousin would speak it. So we'd get together, ain't no way in the world, we wouldn't talk a few words of it. And I always had one that didn't understand what we said. That we were going with the nuns and they'd run and say, Sister, they're talking that stuff again. And she'd fuss at us and stuff and all of that sort. So when I raised my children, I figured if I'd send three or four children at the same school, somewhere along the line they're going to get together and talk it and they're going to have a problem because uh, if somebody pick at you because you can talk that stuff, that's what they call it, and uh, you know what's going to happen. Maybe a, a, a ruckus, a little fight or whatever, and then you'll be put out of school for that. So I figured it was the best thing for me to do is not to do it. But until this day, I wish I would have done it. Whatever happened, happened. That 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 know it, and it's something that you can't take away. So, and the reason why I like to talk French on the kind of that uh, I ain't gonna be here all the time, and I'm gonna take it with me. So if I can spread it around a little bit, I'm happy. Now, I'm going to call Marcel. He la tell the call that we just said on him. Pray. Son papa a dit, il connaît pas trop, enfin il dit, faut, il donne quelque chose pour faire sa vie. Il peut aider à peu près 250, 215 livres, enfin c'est un gros homme. Et fait, il a donné un truc et il a donné un si. Et il a coupé du bois pour aller, pour faire du papier avec. Et un vendredi, il dit, tu connais si je vais à 2000 dirhams mon chemin. Et puis, ma voix et bouteille de pop. Grandma was always talking about her people, but she talked more about it in French than she did English. When somebody would come and ask a question, she'd tell them she didn't speak Americani. <laughs> she spoke French. I guess Grandma told us a lot of things in French that we didn't understand. It, at that particular time, because I, I never did understand French. Except what, you know, the regular French grandma would use every day. It is such an interesting question about where Marie Therese is buried. Um, I think, I suspect she was probably buried um, at her plantation, which is not this one. Um, for a while in the 20th century, it was popularly believed that Melrose Plantation itself was where uh, Quan Quan set up her plantation and where she lived. Um, but further research has uh, shown that it was her son, Louis Matoyer, who built this place. But I'm sure she visited it. You know, I, she seems like she was very close to her family. Um, but I suspect she was probably buried uh, at her own plantation um, further north. I've heard she may be buried adjacent to um, Augustine. I've heard that. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of folklore out there, but when you start putting it together and you look at the evidence, you said, well, yeah, that makes sense. I, I don't know where, but I was told that, um, you know, the year she passed, that page of book was torn out of the church records. Yes, so no one know where she's buried. I have a relative said that uh, someone told him uh, where he thought she was buried, and he may let you know. I thought uh, she probably is buried at the American Cemetery, where uh, in the cemetery where Claude Thomas is buried. Maybe not right by him, but uh, I feel like she's in that cemetery. And I've 
when I first started working here many years ago, um, a tourist operator from Baton Rouge or somewhere told me that yes, she was. But I wasn't able to get any information from him. Uh, you know, like I say, he was with the tour bus and uh, he wasn't from this area, but he told me that's where she was buried. And uh, so nobody, there's a lot of stuff people really don't know about Marie Therese, you know. But all um, I ever heard of, you know, they talk about her son, the church. The name of the church is St. Augustine. We all go there. My grandparents are buried there. My grand grandmother's buried there. I'm a descendant of uh, Marie Therese Coin Coin, which is not buried there. And we can't really decide where she is buried around here. Um, uh, but Lewis is buried there. Everyone of my descendants are buried there. And uh, it was a lot of fun growing up in the south, in the bayou country down here. Um, we had um, a lot of family. We have a lot left that are in this area. And uh, there's no grave marker around Cane River for her. But there are stories about, about where she is, where, that plant, where her place used to be. And there is a little graveyard back there, but there's no markers. And so we believe that that's probably where she's buried. Uh, as far as my family, that's where we believe, you know, because of, you know, when you just traced down, when you lived right here and there's a graveyard right over there. So it's kind of like, we, we, that's what we believe. Now, I don't know, history-wise, historians, I don't know, but just the old uh, kitchen talk. Where's Marie Therese Coin Coin buried? Uh, the lady that gave the information for the meals, a lot of her, uh, uh, Miss Lietta Baccarini Coot. When, I don't know if it was Gary or his wife Elizabeth, took her up to American Cemetery where Claude Thomas is buried, along with his white wife. Her name was Marie Therese also. And the legend at that time, a long time ago, passed down, was that she was born, she was buried in that cemetery. And they had a record of all the people that are buried in that cemetery. And Miss Lietta said that either her grandparents or her parents told her that her grave was over there somewhere. And I can tell you, Mark, when you interview Mark, he can tell you, because he's the one that went up there with her. She was buried over in this area here, okay? When they went to view the record book of all the people that was buried in American Cemetery, when it came to the dates where she would have been listed, they were torn out. So, we can't prove it, disprove it, but this is not the original cemetery, of course, so, I mean, we have another cemetery called Shallow Lake Cemetery. You, I don't know if you've been, you've been there? Yeah, yeah, right back by Clutcherville. That was even older than this one, but we stopped burying over there when we built this church, and now, for the most part, all our ancestors are, I mean, it's been here for a couple hundred years, but um, I don't know. As far as the community itself, I would say we stayed intact until my grandmother's generation, which is who I lived with for three years. They were the first generation to migrate out from the Cane River community because before we were one big community, we had everything in common, we all went to church here and this was the only church. It's very easy for anyone to research their family history for the last 200 years because baptisms, births, marriages, deaths were all registered right here in the church. So that's why we can trace our genealogy and our ancestry back very easily. I'm a seventh generation of Marie Therese and Claude Thomas. And uh, growing up, I wasn't interested in history. So it was a late in life when I really got interested in history. She was Catholic, 
and baptized at the um, St. John Baptiste Ford at the Immaculate Conception Church. Uh, her, her ten children were Catholics. I don't know about the other five. I can't say I didn't read about if they were Catholics, but she made a hand carved rosary for each one of those children. And I heard uh, that uh, one of the relatives in New Orleans still had uh, a matoir, still had uh, one of those rosaries. Among Marie Therese and her 10 children, they had over 18,000 acres of land. Over 18,000 acres of land. They say about a distance from Natchitoches until like Monet Ferry, and that would be about maybe 15 miles south of here, that far of a distance. And about, uh, I was told, uh, maybe like uh, 20, 30 years ago, that family members still owned about 16,000. Well, we lived on the Herzog Plantation when I was growing up. And we lived right at the end of the, uh, the spillway. We had a big house there, and, and that's where we lived. And Daddy always farmed and fished and all kind of stuff like that. Grandma always spoke French. No English, whatever. She said her prayers in French. She did everything in French. But we came from the Matoya family. They all came to school to St. Augustine and it crossed the river that was before they built the dam and you know got the spillway going and stuff like that they had to bring the boat for the people that was living over what they now call cat island and the people was living over there and he would call them and tell them to bring the boat because the children was coming back from school i guess <laughs> grandma told us a lot of things in french that we didn't understand it at that particular time, because I, I never did understand French. Except what, you know, the regular French grandma would use every day. There was always Frenchmen, never American. Grandma would tell everybody she was a Frenchman, she was an old Americana, that's what she called it. <laughs> it wasn't always pleasant living under the white man, because you never could, you never could make a really good living. As long as you were working, you know, well, he'd give you a place for you to make a garden and you could raise a cow or you could raise your own horses if you wanted to. Other than that, you didn't get nothing from that plantation. You could work all the, all the summer and at the end of the year, they tell you, sorry, you didn't come out in debt this year, but you didn't make any money either after all that work you've done. I was born on this plantation in December 1948. The same year Kami Henry died. We live here as sharecroppers until 1954, and we moved to Oakland Plantation, and we stayed there until 1962. Sharecropping was the only way for a black family to make a living who owned no land, and you definitely didn't make any money on sharecropping. So I grew up running around plantation. I went to the cotton field at five years old. And the way we were educated was that you went to school when the crops were in, which was like December. So your whole life was geared around that plantation. Even our schools were set up that we had classes to teach young black boys how to do things that supported the plantation. How to, black girls, how to do things to support the plantation. How to work in the big house. That was a career move 
to get a chance to work in the big house. Black boys to get a chance to t take a little welding, uh, take a little carpentry, all geared toward working on a plantation. After mechanization, we wouldn't need it anymore. So one by one, we were asked to leave. After hundreds of years, these families owned these plantations, left swinging their hands. The land is still in the hands of the enslavers, and their families and families will continue to generate wealth off of what we built. Okay. So when I retired, I came back and I went to work with Oakland Plantation which is the last plantation we lived on. And the two slave shacks that's there, I lived in them because my mother worked part-time and my older sisters in the big house. The only reason why those two slave shacks are there is because the people, and they were, people lived in them until the mid-70s because those people worked in the big house. Out of about 25 or 30 slave shacks, those are the only two left. Because when mechanization showed up, they tore the rest of them down, plowed them under, and uh, sent everybody packing. I call that the final exodus of black people, lives on the plantation. After 300 years of living on a plantation, that mechanical piece of equipment drove up and you were told goodbye. And you left with nothing after generations and generations of making wealth for that one family. So that's the life of a sharecropper. As more and more people begin to write about it now, but too many people don't want to hear about it. You know, it brings back too many memories. To me, it's history. I'm in it. I'm all in. I'm all in. And that's what it is. It's our history. going home to a place I've never known on the river across the sky I'm going home resurrection of the past resurrection a memories that last when I look into your eyes I see me this is not a dream it's my destiny to find the very seed that created me to be it's a resurrection where you end is where i begin i'm here to tell your story about your love every 
everything you did is still standing here from your pain and courage has changed our world it's a resurrection But you wanna hear, baby? Sweet tunes by Kiss Crow. In control, yeah. Control, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. In control. But you wanna hear, baby? Say me, can't hear my wire, mommy. Hey, bro, me so. I don't know what I feel do to thank you. Me, yeah, yeah, yo, me, yeah, yeah. In a zombo. I'm so, so grateful for the life I'm living 24-7, the joy I'm counting I don't say you they in control, yeah Control, yeah I don't say you they in control, yeah Control, yeah I don't say you they Control, yeah Control, yeah I don't say you they in control How we sort of have the lineage of Marie Therese Coin Coin as a part of the Cammy Henry Research Center. And Vandri Di, he did. She couldn't see that do me a little bit more. She may. I feel my water and bouté, the pop. We had a big house there, and that's where we lived. And daddy always farmed and fished. 